not yet known. But the task is monumental. Billions are still unreached, living without the hope and love of Christ. In 2023, over 879,000 people heard the gospel, 141,000 people believed, and 116,000 were baptized. Yet, so many more still wait for their chance to hear and believe. Lostness is not just a statistic. It's an eternal reality for billions of souls. But amidst the challenges, there's hope. The Great Pursuit is a faithful journey fueled by love, compassion, and the unwavering belief in the transformative power of the gospel. Stories of redemption, reconciliation, and restoration inspire us to press on. Our vision is rooted in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. A multitude from every corner of the world united in worshiping Jesus Christ. You are called to play your part in this vision. Whether you pray fervently, give generously, go boldly, or send faithfully, your role is vital in the great pursuit. Join us in solving the greatest problem in the world, lostness. Together, we spread the message of hope and salvation to every nation, tribe, and town. This is the Great Pursuit. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, that video was just showing our monthly em emphasis at Christmas time. We always give to Lottie Moon. Uh, for international missions, and uh, Kim has set up a, a Christmas tree to show uh, each ball is going to represent $100, and so that way you'll be able to see uh, as our offering grows. I'm going to ask if you'll stand with us as we get ready to see our call to worship. I'm going to open this up in prayer. Father God, just thank you for this day. We just ask that you bless this service, Lord. Everything that's said, sung, and done, bring glory to your name. Let us not get in your way as you speak to those who need you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. 
house today, amen? It's wonderful to see everyone. Hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving. If you're visiting here with us, we want to welcome you, and we're glad that you're here. And certainly, if you are a first-time visitor with us, then you'll see one of our, our greeters on the way out today. We have a special gift for you, but we're glad that you're here to worship with us today. This is an exciting season. As we begin this season of Christmas, of Advent, uh, of waiting and anticipation. That's what Advent is about. The anticipation and waiting of the celebration of the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so that is an exciting time. And each week we have a different theme that goes along with Advent. And today the theme is hope. And so I'm going to ask if Wesley will begin making his way here. Wesley is going to read our Advent scripture for today and light the candle of hope for us. Isaiah chapter 40 says, Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and announce to her that her time of hard service is over. Her iniquity has been pardoned, and she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one crying out, Prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Make a straight highway for our God in the, de in the desert. Every valley will be lifted up, and every mountain and hill will be leveled. The uneven ground will become smooth, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will appear, and all humanity together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. that 
we see others, that we are the brightest light in each room, that they see Jesus through us. Lord, I just pray that you help me in my day to day walk, be that light that shines for you. Lord, I lift up all these prayer requests as we mentioned. Lord, I just lift up all those that's in our heart that we're thinking about today. It could be a family member. It could be a lost person. Lord, I just pray that they come to know Jesus before it's too late. Lord, I love you. I love my church family. Lord, I just pray that you continue to let Concord be that beacon on the hill in this community, Lord. Thank you for our pastor. Thank you for all, all the ones who... Who, who do your business here at this church. Lord, I just pray that everything that we do, say and sing, will be in your name. Father God, I just give you all the praise. Of course, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. You'll stand with me. We're going to sing hymn 121.
Alright, this song is called The Night That Hope Was Born, and I thought it seemed appropriate today since we were lighting the hope candle, and that as Thanksgiving just passed, um, it made us all, or it at least made me think how thankful I am that we do have the hope of Jesus, and that not only that he came once, but he's coming back.
meeting here together and be able to open up God's Word. Amen? Amen. I, uh, I want to invite you to take out your Bibles as we continue, as we uh, begin a brand new series called Christmas at the Movies. And um, I want to take, I invite you to take out your Bibles with us. Pull them up. Say this with me. When I open the Bible, when I open the Bible. God opens his mouth. God opens his mouth. Not just what God has said, but it is what God is saying. Do you believe that this morning? Amen. Watching Christmas movies, it is um, a fun way to enjoy family time together. At least it is for our family. Um, there's usually good laughter, sometimes tears, many times repeating phrases or quotes that come from good Christmas movies. Um, and there are many classic uh, movies, but over the next few weeks, we're going to take our biblical text and find some Christmas movies that often have themes that relate quite well to the Christmas story in Scripture as well. So today, we're going to begin the story Every who down in Whoville lived a Christmas, loved Christmas, liked a Christmas a lot. Excuse me. But the Grinch who lived just north of Whoville did not. The Grinch hated Christmas the whole Christmas season. Now, please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be his head wasn't screwed on just right. It could be perhaps that his shoes were tight. It could be perhaps. But I think that most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes, too small. But whatever the reason, his heart or his shoes, he stood there on Christmas Eve hating the Who's. Staring down from his cave with a scour, Grinchy frowned at the warm lighted windows below in their town. For he knew every Who down in Whoville beneath was busy now hanging a mistletoe wreath. And they're hanging their stockings, he snarled with a sneer. Tomorrow is Christmas, it's practically here. And he growled with the Grinch fingers, nervously drumming, I must find some way to stop Christmas coming. Dr. Seuss is How the Grinch Stole Christmas. It's a classic movie, a classic book, and it's a classic tale of how uh, Mr. Grinch had pain and hurt in his life, and that affected who he was and his heart on the inside. It affected his spirit at Christmas, and his bitterness and anger was devoted to stopping Christmas. When we talk about Mr. Grinch, it's a very well-known tune, even, as many of you could probably complete the lines. He's a mean one. Mr. Grinch. Mr. Grinch. There we go. It, it, the book it was first published in 1957. And later on, in 2000, the classic movie came out that many have seen and many have uh, made traditions out of watching at Christmas even. It seems like even today, though, we have plenty of modern day Grinches. Christmas is so disliked by some people that groups like ACLU have threatened people with lawsuits if there's any mention of Christ in the season of Christmas. Global Christian Relief shared a story of how slowly five friends make their way to the women's outhouse they use each day. They look back. No one has followed them. In the stench of the room, they gather in a corner, saying little. Always in muttered whispers, they stand quietly. One woman softly sings. Another leads a short prayer. Year after year, this is what Christmas looks like for believers in a North Korea labor camp. Counting the costs, they risk their lives by coming together to pray, to sing, reflecting on the coming of their Savior both 2,000 years ago and the future day they all hope comes very soon. For millions of believers like these, the celebration of our Savior entering the world will be a risk-laden secret Christmas. They know that there is a war on Christmas and what that war really looks like. 
Even though 90% of Americans celebrate Christmas, even though Christianity is the largest religious group in the nation, Jesus has been repeatedly forced into a closet during the season, so to speak. It seems even since the very beginning of Christmas, there was always a Grinch. And today we're going to talk about the very first Christmas Grinch. Embedded in the hope and peace and joy and love in the story of Christmas is part of the story that's full of tears, part of the story that's full of tragedy, rage, and pain. One that perhaps we would like to forget in the Christmas story, but nonetheless, it's part of the story. In Matthew 2, chapter 2, we find a biblical Grinch, if you will. And that is our text that we'll examine this, this morning. And the setting is set sometime after the birth of Christ. Not the same day, not even a couple of days after, but contrary to what many of us were taught growing up, perhaps anywhere from two weeks to approximately a year and a half after the birth of Christ. Well... Matthew chapter 2, we're going to begin in verse 1 and begin reading. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we saw his star at the rising and had come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes and the people and asked them where the Christ would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them, the exact time the star appeared, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. When you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. After hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star that they had seen at its rising. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling on their knees, they worshipped him, and they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they turned to their own country by another route. After they were gone, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and stay there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to kill him. So they got up, took the child and his mother. He got up, took the child and his mother during the night and escaped to Egypt. He stayed there until Herod's death, so that what was spoken by the Lord to the prophet might be fulfilled. <coughs> Out of Egypt, all my son. Then Herod, when he realized that he had been outwitted by the wise men, flew into rage. He gave orders to massacre all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, in keeping with the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be consoled because they are no more. <clears throat> Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we come to you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. And we thank you for God sending your son, born to be with us. God in flesh to be with us. God, thank you. And today, as we examine your word and your truth, may we take it and apply it to our lives. And teach us more about who you are so we can be more like you. In Jesus' name, God's people said, Amen. So, here in this passage, we see this man who is like the Grinch, hated Christmas. I mean, like Mr. Grinch, Herod tried to prevent. 
Christmas from coming. Like the Grinch, Herod heard, had a heart that was too small. Now make no mistake, Herod was very successful in many respects in his accomplishments in his life. I mean, he was a remarkably successful politician in keeping the peace between Rome, which he had, he had, which had conquered Judea ever since 63 BC. He acted as a Roman governor overseas. He was simply known basically as a client king. Meaning that very often when the Romans conquered a province, they didn't want to send a governor out. There was a local king doing a good enough job. And so, he may be called king. This is what, who Herod was at the time. He was in charge from 40 BC when he was awarded the title of king. But he actually didn't take control until... Uh, with Roman help, he drove out some adversaries out of Jerusalem, and so it was really from about 37 B.C. Uh, on, he is in charge until his death, about 4 B.C. Now, he was remarkably successful in a lot of ways. He deserved the title of Herod the Great. If we talk about his accomplishments through much of his life, I mean, he had some great accomplishments. He was the one, of course, who rebuilt the great temple in Jerusalem. He was the one who single-handedly uh, uh, created the city of Caesarea, where there was no really good port for ships in all of the Holy Land. And he creates one by sinking some ships and using those hulls as a base to build upon he built Caesarea in 12 years, and he built other cities like that as well. He renovated the entire city of Jerusalem. In addition to building a gorgeous uh, palace for himself, he had the Hippodrome, which was a stadium. He had theaters. Uh, he also built seven great fortresses across the land from which he could defend his administration. And one of them, of course, was the most, success, most famous was Masada, down along the southwest corner of the Dead Sea. Everything Herod touched diplomatically seemed to turn to gold. He was successful in many, many ways. He kept peace both in Jerusalem and in Rome. So in that sense, he was very successful. However, when he sought to find Jesus, it was all for the wrong reasons. And that's the first thing. We need to take away from today is seeking Jesus needs to have the right motivation. <clears throat> seeking Jesus needs to have the right motivation. When we look at the text, we see Herod was looking for Jesus for all the wrong reasons. He was a man who craved power. He, he, he craved control over all of his life. In fact, it was after Herod learned the location that he actually summoned the wise men. He began to question them about when was the exact time that you saw the star appear. And then he sends them off on this special mission to search for a child, for the child, and then report back to him so that, they could, so that he could come and worship him. Right? Was that really his desire? No. To worship Jesus? No, no that wasn't really his true motivation as we see in the text the real motivation is that he might destroy Jesus in order to protect his throne many have the wrong motivation in seeking Jesus today you've probably known people or maybe you've had those wrong motivations even in your life at, at some point reasons like they want to be where relatives are when they die you see that all the time, even in funerals. Well, I, I, I want to get saved so I can be with my relatives in heaven. While that's true, that's great, but that's not quite the right motivation for Jesus. Jesus wants you to surrender your life so you can be with him. They want Jesus to fix all their problems at home. They want Jesus to cure them of disease. They want Jesus to give them... Uh, the finances that they, they want. They want Jesus to lead them in certain areas of life, but not all areas of life. They want to worship Him on Sundays, but worship the ways of the world on Monday. 
They say, I want to worship Jesus, but their motives are far off, and therefore their worship is unfaithful as a harlot. When we come seeking Jesus, we need to have the right motivation because he knows our hearts. Amen. Psalm 139, 1 through 4 says, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You understand my thoughts from far away. You observe my travels and my rest. You are aware of all my ways before a word is on my tongue. You know about it, Lord. So off the wise men go. Now traveling to Bethlehem. We must understand that these men were far from far in the east near Babylon. It's possible that they had been traveling more than six months, maybe even over a year when they arrived in Jerusalem, but now they're only six miles from the king of the world. They're only six miles. The one from the one who would save the entire world, only six miles from the creator of the universe. When you look at it that way, Boy, they're so close, aren't they? Warren Wearsby said it perfectly when he said the Magi were seeking the king. Herod was opposing the king and the Jewish priests were ignoring the king. These priests knew the scriptures. They pointed others to the Savior, but they would not go to worship him themselves. They quoted scriptures like Micah 5, 2, which says, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you are small among the clans of Judah, one will come from you to be the ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from ancient times. They quoted verses like this, but they did not obey them. The wise men, they, they came to Jesus, but with one motivation. They had the right motivation. They came to find the one born king of the Jews. They came to worship him. And when the Lord drew them, they heard and they responded. Despite their paganism, despite their mystical science background, despite the superstition, they recognized God's voice and he, when he spoke. And though having a limited spiritual light, they immediately recognized God's light when it appeared. And they genuinely came with seeking hearts, hearts that the Lord promises will find him. The thing is, the throne is rightfully the Lord's. Amen? Amen? It is rightfully His. We cannot fight for control. Herod was in power. He was a, a power wrench, even with his family. Listen to this. Dr. Mayer, professor of ancient history, described Herod's home as a can of worms simply because he married ten wives. Each of those produced princes for him. Each of those male princes was always scheming to secede him as number one. There was only, there could only be though one single number one. And Herod wanted to make sure he was going to be it. Jo Josephus gives us just a, a hideous tale of what's going on with his family with attempted poisonings, one brother against another brother. It's so rattled Herod, that he actually put to death three of his own sons on suspicion of treason. He put to death his favorite wife out of ten of them. And then he killed his mother-in-law. Or should I say, one of his mother-in-laws. He invited the high priest down to Jericho for a swim. They played a rough game of water polo, they said. And then he drowned them. He killed several uncles, a couple cousins. Some had said sarcastically that he was a real family man. As a matter of fact, Augustus himself, to whom Herod was always a little different, he said, I would rather be Herod's pig than his own son. You say, well, how could, could, could Herod actually do such a hideous act with all these newborn babies? You tell me. After hearing the history of his own family. When we come to Jesus, we have to be willing, though, to dethrone ourselves and allow him to be king of our hearts. Yes. 
Because the throne is rightfully the Lord's. The king of our desires, he's got to be the king of our eyes, the king of our finances, the king of our future, the king of our family, the king of our careers, the king of our, our hobbies, king of our, our time, king of our bodies. He has got to be king. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20 says, Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. For you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. So let me ask you, what are you putting in your body? That temple of God. What are you putting in it? Because it's, if it's harmful, you're polluting the temple of the Lord. The throne is rightfully the Lord's. And in God's providence, his divine control, he orchestrated protection over his son in flesh. Look at verse 12. It says, after being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. And after they were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Get up, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I tell you. For Herod's about to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and escaped to Egypt. He stayed there until Herod's death so that what was spoken of through the prophet might be fulfilled. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Something about Herod and the Grinch. Even though they tried to stop Christmas, it didn't happen, did it? Herod never changed. In, in fact, when he found out that he had been outwitted, he again tried to take matters into his own control again. Look at verse 16. Then Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the wise men. He flew into a rage. He gave orders to massacre all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, in keeping with the time that he had learned from the wise men. He was going to make sure that Jesus was taken care of. He was going to make sure that there was no king of the Jews to take his throne. He was going to make sure that maybe he, he missed him at a month. Maybe he missed him at two months. But he was not going to miss because he was going to wipe out every child two years old and under. Every boy. But here's the thing. In order to see Jesus for who he really is, one has to open their heart. In order to see Jesus for who he truly is, one has to open their heart. Herod wasn't willing to open his heart. Herod wasn't willing to, to, to listen to the scribes and teachers. He wasn't willing to, to listen to the prophets' words. He wasn't willing to actually seek the king of kings. While estimates of the number of babies killed, they sometimes are exaggerated. It's generally thought that perhaps 20 or 30 babies actually die. You can actually go to a place where there are skulls of children that Herod killed in the Holy Land today. There's no way, and, and even though it's 20 to 30, there's no way to minimize, there's no way minimizes Herod's guilt. Oh, it's terrible. Or the grief or suffered by the parents of these children. One is too many. Why did Matthew choose to give us the details about this massacre and tell us nothing about the death of Herod? I mean, perhaps we would have been glad to hear about that. However, through this we were reminded that Jesus came to die at the hands of unbelieving Jews and Gentiles. We encountered the name Jesus in Matthew chapter 1 when it says she will give birth to a son. You're to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. The way Jesus would save the people from their sins was by dying in, in, by, as an innocent sacrifice. On the cross of Calvary, the birth of our Lord Jesus, it was a joyous occasion, but it was the birth of the Savior who would die in Jerusalem. So Matthew sets the scene. 
early in the gospel, the people in Jerusalem and its rulers, they were, they were deeply troubled that the report that the king of the Jews had been born in Bethlehem, they were disturbed and were threatened, and so was Herod. Different than Herod, though. The Grinch. The Grinch realized something. And something happened to old Grinch, different from Herod. If you remember, something changed within his heart. Jeff, we play the clip. Grinch feet, I see. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet, I see. Grinch with his Grinch feet, I see. He doesn't want to give it up. <laughs> it worked earlier, didn't it? Yeah. And the Grinch with his Grinch feet, I see. is all understanding because I can't find that hope in any other place. 
I can't find joy in any place that I've looked in life. I can't find peace. Let me tell you, the place you'll only find true hope, peace, and joy, and love is in Jesus. All other, all else will fail. All other else will fall away. All these worldly <coughs> things in life, they're here today, they're gone tomorrow. But Jesus is eternal. So I invite you today. Won't you surrender to Jesus and open your heart so that he can fill you with the greatest gift of all. He came to be with us. Would you stand together and pray with me? Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, that we can come into your house, that we can worship you. God, I pray today that today would be the day if someone doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior. Today would be the day that they surrender to you. Today would be the day that they seek after hope. They find hope in life through you, Jesus. God, if someone doesn't know you, God, today I pray that they recognize Jesus as king of their life, that you want to be on the throne of their heart, and that we as a people of God are willing to dethrone ourselves so that you can sit in your rightful place. God, we pray today that you would move in our hearts and we would know that Christmas is about you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, let's sing together. If you need to respond, why don't you come now and respond to the Lord's calling upon your life.
moment. This is Betty Clark, and this is Darren's mother, and uh, I come to you with excitement to share with you. Uh, it's been a few months back, I guess, that Betty has surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior, and uh, she wants to come today to officially join our church body as uh, a new believer in Christ, <coughs> joined through baptism. And so we praise the Lord through that. Amen. All these Amen. 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 I think that is the first of, uh, of Betty joining our church. And uh, I'm just happy for her. Continue to pray for her. And uh, as God uses her as he sees fit. And I want to invite her as well if she wants to uh, just be up here up front. If you'd like to hug her neck or shake her hand and let her know you love her and pray for her. That will be a, a wonderful gesture to her as well as a new sister in Christ. Amen. Amen. So, Betty, if you'll just wait right there uh, here on this front row, people can come greet you at the end of the service. And I'm going to ask if Jamie will close us out in prayer, but there's a lot of different uh, announcements and things in your bulletin. If you take a look at those, things happening throughout the week, um, uh, be inviting. Uh, we're having a, a communion and candlelight service, so be inviting people to come to that on the 24th. And we've got services all throughout this month, and I know uh, the sac right after church, they're having um, choir practice as they get ready for the musical here in just a couple of weeks. And um, so if you would, we will not be having services this evening. It will be a family time at home, so enjoy time with your family. But we look forward to worshiping together again the next time. All right, Jamie, would you close this out in prayer? Father God, we just come to you, God, today, and we just thank you for everything you've done for us. We thank you for uh, what has happened in this service. God, we, we pray for hearts and minds that have changed. God, we just uh, thank you so much for Miss Betty, Lord, just as uh, she's made this decision for Christ, and God, she's decided to make it public uh, here in our church body and join us as a group of believers, Lord who are searching after you. I pray that we are all actively searching after you. Lord, let our hearts be like the Grinches this morning, Lord, and just let us have a bigger heart for you, a bigger heart for others, and share the love of Christ everywhere that we go, because God, is, that is our witness to you, Lord, it is our love uh, for others, and just our, God, you give us so much to share with other people. I pray that we do not waste that. God, just be with us as we go out and everything we do to be. We glory to your name. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen.